good morning to you. Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining me again uh, on this uh, glorious day. This is a day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Um, so, uh, before I get going, um, let's just make sure I've got all of these things are showing properly. Um, today's um, readings were Luke 9, John 6 and Matthew 15. Let's put that up a little bit. Yep. And tomorrow's is Mark 7 and Matthew 16. Um, I want to start with um, a prayer, um, and uh, so let's pray, shall we? <clears throat> o God, who has so greatly loved us and mercifully redeemed us, give us your grace, that in everything we may yield ourselves, our will, and our works. Uh, we'll continue your thanks to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. That was a prayer which was in the Westminster Directory of Worship of 1647. 1647. Um, so hopefully we've uh, had a look at um, the uh, readings for today. Um, I'm concentrating upon this passage, Matthew 15, 1 through 20. By the way, uh, whilst yesterday was not live, uh, the video is still there for yesterday if you just go to the YouTube channel or to the Mount Calvary Swansea UK website you will find it there uh, so let's uh, let's have a look at uh, this passage um, which I called uh, what is in our hearts um, the whole passage is about what is in our hearts and Jesus starts with examples of God's law and men's law that contradict uh, it seems that actually we really want religion. Uh, Christian history shows us that if you come up with a symbol for something that's biblical, uh, then change it, we change it then to a ritual, and then it becomes a sign of our inner spirituality. Uh, and uh, uh, maybe you can think of examples in the church where uh, the, this is what we think of as Christian and biblical, but we find no evidence of it in scripture. So what about pews? Are they mentioned in the scripture? Well, of course not. Are chairs for that matter? No, they're not. Um, what about our hymns and or modern choruses you know, that de deciding whether we would like to go for traditional, let's see that the key is in the name, isn't it? Traditional or in the modern contemporary, Christian worship. Um, the thing is that uh, there's no uh, biblical basis for any of them. They probably used the Psalms. Uh, what about changing uh, the seating arrangement so that we are more likely more in a circle? Well, I think that has more scriptural evidence for it than it does for us sitting in straight lines in a um, in a building. Uh, what about communion? We, of course, communion in those days, it would have been from a single cup and from a single loaf of bread. Uh, or maybe now with the virus and everything, maybe that's not such a good idea right now. But these are a few examples which some people uh, think as being Christian or are tradition, uh, but actually have no basis in scripture. Um, and the things which replace them may not have anything to do with uh, scripture either. I mean, I wonder whether the hairs on your on the <laughs> the hairs stood up on the back of your necks during mention of any of those. Um, the strength of feeling we have for tradition reveals how much we treat rules we have created as something that God created. But Jesus pointed out this very clearly to the Pharisees then, the danger of replacing God's things for ours, even when it is meant well. <clears throat> and the basis of all this is because of the heart. The heart is interesting. Uh, the heart is interesting anyway, uh, the, the real heart. Uh, it can pump good and bad blood around our system. Uh, a childhood friend of mine had leukemia, and what his heart did was pump bad 
had blood around and it just pushed the disease all around his body. It resulted in his early death. Now in scripture, the heart in a uh, spiritual sense is the source of sin and it pushes it around in us. And Matthew gives a list of six things in Matthew 15 that defile us whilst Mark's gospel gives us 11. Um, and so just some of these things, uh, the heart, it, the, uh, it creates evil thoughts and, it def and we make plans to sin so what's in this list well there's adulteries and fornication which of course includes looking lustfully at those whom you should not uh, there's murder uh, which anger is a part of there's thieving there's covetousness but covetousness is an interesting word it's greediness for gain um, it can be material or position uh, wickedness well, the word wickedness uh, has within it the sense of um, looking to hurt people, not just physically necessarily. Uh, then there's deceit, lewdness, an evil eye. Now, that's an interesting one, isn't it? And But evil eye has to do with selfishness or stinginess. Uh, blasphemy, which of course we consider it being slander against God. But of course, it does include slander against others too. Uh, pride and foolishness, um, uh, these are things which are works done without respect to God or to others. See, all of these things, you know, I, 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 I think that we could probably include ourselves in here somewhere. None of us can claim to be innocent. When tempted to sin, uh, we, we, have, we can either give in to it or we can cause the devil to flee. Um, let me uh, bring up uh, that, hopefully. Um, we have a verse here. No temptation has overtaken you uh, that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. <clears throat> so, uh, whilst, whilst we uh, are tempted, we do have a way to escape. Remember, we mentioned in Hebrews uh, 12 on Sunday, uh, we are told to lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely. Uh, we have a responsibility. And we must teach as Jesus taught. The outward performance does not convert the heart. The outward performance is not evidence of a spiritual life. That's just as true of pastors as it is of anybody else. Jesus is making it clear that the heart of every person is not intrinsically good, but evil. There is a bent in us to do wrong. Uh, scripture says in Jeremiah 17, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? And then Romans 3, which I'd like to read to you, um, just a, a few verses. Um, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave, they use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asp is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This is a statement uh, not just of our nation, uh, but also uh, us. <laughs> But since we come to know Jesus, uh, we have been given um, a flesh um, uh, of, um, uh, we've been given a new heart and a new spirit that's been put within us. And, uh, and in Ezekiel it says, I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Our hearts are soft and our hearts are changed. We are radically uh, different to what we were uh, and the only thing that can uh, make that difference is not 
works, not uh, doing spiritual things. It is only the gospel. Only the gospel can make a bad heart good. Jesus said, uh, unless one is born again, he cannot even see the kingdom of God. And now we are sought and light in this world. We're not to be conformed to its likeness. We're not to be like the world. We are to transform the world. But apart from Christ, the world is desperately lost. Lost. It can only be redeemed by the shed blood of Jesus. There's no other way. We can polish the outside. We can educate ourselves. We can get involved in politics. We can do good things. All good, of course. However, in the end, none of these things would truly change us, society or the world. We and they need Christ. And as we read in the uh, other reading today, in John 6, um, if you, let's see, let's, let me see if I can get that up as well. Um, here we go. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. And in verse 40, it says this, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. We have the promises uh, in uh, Scripture of what Jesus said, that he wants to save us. He wants to put in us a new heart, that we will be changed. And it is the will of God to, uh, to believe on him. It is at that moment when we put our trust in him that our hearts are changed. Uh, we cannot change from the outside in. It has to come from the inside out. When we become Christians, we have been given the Holy Spirit and he's come to transform our hearts and we have become like him. We are changed, we are transformed. And then, now, now we are in this situation. Now we are to put all that effort in making the world know Christ and at the same time, knowing him better for ourselves, being transformed by the renewing of our minds. That's Romans 12, 1 and 2. Let's, uh, let's think about these things. I, I want to close out uh, this devotion today with uh, another fantastic um, hymn, um, and I'm sure that you'll have the music <laughs> running through your mind, but I'm not going to be singing it to you today. What a wonderful change my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul for which long I had sought since Jesus came into my heart. And here's the chorus, which I'm not going to repeat every time. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy o my soul like the sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart. I have ceased from my wandering and going astray since Jesus came into my heart. And my sins, which were many, are all washed away since Jesus came into my heart. I'm possessed of a hope that is steadfast and sure since Jesus came into my heart. And no, long, and no dark clouds of doubt now my pathway obscure since Jesus came into my heart. There's a light in the valley of death now for me since Jesus came into my heart. And the gates of the city beyond I can see since Jesus came into my heart. I shall go there to dwell in that city I know, since Jesus came into my heart. And I'm happy, so happy as onward I go, since Jesus came into my heart. And the main thing I want to uh, remember, think about here is that what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my life. It, you see, it's, it's he who does the change in us. And that's the thing that I want us to take with us today. Um, let's keep our eyes upon him. Uh, let's keep uh, our, um, our hearts uh, filled with him. The more we are filled with his spirit, the more we will show him in our lives, the more the fruit of the spirit will be demonstrated. Uh, so now, 
keep your eyes looking up for our redemption draws near. Amen. God bless.